take your Bibles and turn first of all to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 19 and then find uh, your, your section in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 because we want to read, I want to read two different accounts of the triumphal entry. So we're going to first read Luke chapter 19, Luke's account, and then a few minutes later we'll flip over to Matthew chapter 21 and we'll read Matthew's account of the triumphal entry since that is what Today is a Palm Sunday. We want to look at some text and learn some things about that. And moms and dads, if you have your children, um, have children, you might want to really take notes today. And then I have a resource that you can take home with you this week. And each day or each night this week, you can have a study time with your children to uh, see and review where... Jesus was each day in his the final light, final hours, the final days of his life as he goes to the city of Jerusalem and ministers for the last time. Before I read the text, a couple of things. If you're in the men's class on Sunday morning or the women's class on Sunday morning, they've made a change in their schedule. Because next Sunday is Easter Sunday and everybody will be getting, some of the moms will be getting their children's Easter outfits and all that kind of stuff, they, the, they want to skip next Sunday and start back the week after. So there's a change in your, in your schedule. You'll not be meeting on Easter Sunday. You'll pick up the week after Easter, all right? And then, more importantly, this Thursday night, some of you are new here at Hope, and you've never been with us this time of the year on Passion Week, but on Thursday nights, we have a service here on Thursday night of this week at 6 o'clock. We'll have the Lord's Supper, and we'll celebrate communion together, and then we'll look at some of the events that took place on Thursday night of Jesus' life. That's the night, of course, that he instituted the Lord's Supper, washed his disciples' feet. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane there and prayed and, and then later betrayed in the garden and arrested and his trial began on Thursday night. We'll look at some of that and the significance of Thursday night for the Christian life. So join us this Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Then after the service, we have pizza in the fellowship hall and then you bring some homemade desserts and we'll have a good Good time of fellowship. It's a wonderful time on Thursday night. Monday, Thursday, we call it. The church calls, calls it Monday, Thursday. So join us then. Uh, Luke chapter 19. And struggling just a little bit this morning. I passed two kidney stones this week. And, uh, and I think another one is, is on its way. <laughs> so... Uh, Bear with me this morning. I think I'll be fine. I'm just trying to concentrate on the text. Once I get going, I'll be fine. So Luke chapter 19, we'll begin reading in verse 28. It says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where you has you, where as you entered, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose him and bring it here. Now, Wade was referring to Matthew's account. Matthew mentions a colt, and of course a donkey, but here it's. He, uh, Luke's account just mentions the coat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you are losing it, or loosing it, thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the coat, the owner of it said to them, Why are you loosing the coat? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own cloths or clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus or set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near 
the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had done, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now Luke gives this account. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave you, leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now that's a prophetic word from Jesus. And those words would come to pass about 35 years from the point Jesus said this. For the Romans would come in and sack Jerusalem and destroy the temple, completely destroy the temple. Guys, many of you know and some of you are like me. You grew up in the decade of the 60s. Uh, my Brother and sister, their generation, their group were graduating from high school and one of two things, you had one of two choices in the 60s, you'd either go to college or you went to Vietnam. And, uh, but I was a child, much younger than my brothers and sisters, and that was the decade of my childhood I was playing during those years, playing, of course, with the G.I. Joes and, and uh, playing Army out in the backyard. And, um, then in the 70s, I came of age in the 70s. That's, I tell people that's when I started really listening to music and it started making sense to me. In fact, Carla and I were, were wedded in, uh, in 1977 and we're dated. I mean, if I could show you a picture, if you looked in our wedding album, I was wearing a baby blue tuxedo. <laughs> All the ruffles and, you know, on the shirt. And uh, that was the thing. That was the cutting, cutting edge back in those days. And the eight-track player, you know, under the, under the dash. It hung under the dash in the pickup truck and listened to all those songs. It was during those days when I was a child and then, of course, in the 70s. Those were two decades that, that were very impressionable years of my Christian experience because... My parents came to know Christ in the 50s when we were living in the north. And so they sat under the preaching. You might know, remember Bill Rice and Dr. John R. Rice? My parents sat under his preaching and teaching ministry. And then in the 60s, they moved us to the south, and we immediately found a church in the south. And, uh, you know, I didn't know it at that time, but there was a difference in the northern version of Christianity and the southern version of Christianity. The southern Baptist church, and I'm not talking about the southern Baptist convention, I'm just talking about the Baptist church in the south was different from the Baptist church in the north. And in the Baptist church in the south, we were taught things like Christianity really was more about the things that you shouldn't do, things that you should give up, more than about knowing God. And so I grew up in those impressionable years thinking that Christianity, of course, was about giving up certain things in your life. And, you know, we couldn't, this, the girls couldn't wear shorts and we couldn't go to movies and the boys couldn't have their hair too long and on and on it went. Those kinds of, if you kept those rules, then you were accepted within your Baptist group. And some of you grew up in the very same thing. As I grew older and began to read more, and through the kind providence of God being exposed to some different preachers, Baptist preachers, in fact, 
I, my eyes began to open up to what Christianity was really about. It was during those years, in the late 80s, early 90s, that I picked up a book that was written by a man named Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew. Anybody, read, anybody in here ever read that book? The Jesus I Never Knew. When I started reading that book, I thought, I really did. I thought I was reading a biography of my life. He was the, about the same age, growing up in the Baptist church in the South, experiencing the very same things that I was going through. I mean, we were taught things like the Catholics didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why the Catholic girls wore that necklace on their shirt, you know, with the cross and the little man on the cross. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's the kinds of things we were taught. As I grew older, I figured out that they did believe in the resurrection. I was wrong about that, and so were many of my Christian friends. And then when I got to seminary, I began to learn some new things about Christianity. My eyes began to open up. And I've, all, I've shared this with you many times, guys. I spent the first half of my Christian life learning about God, and the last half of my Christian life I've been learning how to know God, and there's a difference. One of the things that I learned as I came of age and began to study the scriptures, the, the church, churches that I grew up in, we, we didn't spend a lot of time during Holy Week focusing upon the things that happened on Palm Sunday or what happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We just rushed right to Easter Sunday. I never knew there was a special service on sun, Thursday nights called Monday Thursday service until I was about in my mid-30s. But when I begin to read the Gospel accounts, what I discovered is that when the gospel writers came to the final week of Jesus' life, the story, the text, actually slows down instead of speeds up. In fact, if you look through the gospel accounts, about one-third of their time is spent on the final days of Jesus. And so when I realized that, I, I started thinking, we need to pay attention to what's happening in these days. Some very powerful, important truths are being taught by Jesus in his final days. So instead of speeding up to Easter Sunday, in the last years of my ministry, I've been taking the time and slowing down and pondering the final week of Jesus. And many of you, and that's been a, you've been part of this church for a while, you know that we do this. And so I put together a little sheet called the final week of our Lord. And I've listed what happened, the prominent things that happened on Triumphal Entry Day, Palm Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then when we get to Easter Sunday, we celebrate Easter Sunday. And I'm just going to quickly review this because I've got this printed up for you to take home. And you can take this home. And I've provided the gospel accounts and you can read the gospel accounts with your family each night and review what's going on. Celebrate and remember. And ponder what we're being taught in the scriptures by the word of God from the gospel accounts. This is Sunday, the triumphal entry. There's a text in Matthew 21 we'll read in a second. We read Luke's account. But I want to share Matthew 21 in just a few minutes because he shares some details that the gospel, or Luke's account doesn't share. But on Monday morning, Jesus goes into the city of Jerusalem and he curses, remember he curses the fig tree. And then he cleanses the temple. Remember that day Jesus goes into the temple and he sees the money changers at their tables and they're, he's, they're taking advantage of the people. They're making extreme, extravagant profits and he he says, you've turned my temple, my house, into a den of thieves. And he overturns the tables. And he said, this place is to be a house of prayer and a lesson for us. So on Monday, he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday, Jesus dares to go back to the temple. And he teaches several parables on Tuesday. 
This is all written down for you, so you don't have to write this down if you don't want to. He teaches the parable of the tenants, the Great Commission. The seven woes are found in Matthew 23. Then that evening, Jesus goes back to the city of Bethany, which is very close to the city of Jerusalem, because there's where he goes to spend the night, the evenings. And he goes to the house of of the home of Simon the leper. This is in Matthew chapter 26. And you know what happens that night in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper? Remember the young lady there who has the alabaster jar of very expensive perfume and she pours that perfume out on Jesus' feet and she takes her hair and dries his feet And then she's ridiculed by some of the disciples for doing that because they say, you could have sold that perfume for a lot of money and fed the poor. And Jesus rebukes the disciples for saying that because that picture that night, and this is something that you can teach your children, that alabaster jar of expensive perfume has a beautiful symbolism to it. It's a foreshadow of the extravagant gift that God the Father is going to make for us as He gives His only begotten Son. And Jesus is going to pour out His blood for atonement of sin. Now Wednesday come and Wednesday of the week is filled with the the temple authorities plotting against Jesus. we got to get rid of this man. And the issue is, of course, as we're going to see and as we come to the text in Matthew, we're going to see that there is the great potential of a riot breaking out because Jesus is being considered as the Messiah, the one who's come to set us free from the Romans, And people have come before saying they're the Messiah. And the religious leaders are afraid that the Roman centurions are going to be called out to snuff out these riots. And this is going to be trouble for the Jewish leaders. So there's a plot against Jesus, partly because of the riot. And the other is because of the claims that Jesus has made during his ministry that he is indeed the Son of God, the only one who can forgive sin. And then we come to Thursday. We won't spend time on Thursday today because that's what we'll talk about Thursday night. But Jesus is arrested that night in the Garden of Gethsemane and the trial begins. And then Friday morning, the trial, early in that morning, the trial is concluded because the Jews know that Jesus needs to get to the cross. They need to crucify Jesus. So by 9 a.m., he's on the cross, and then the death occurs, the scripture says, at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., so Jesus can get buried before Passover, which is Saturday. Then, of course, Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. So that's a quick overview of what's happening in this special week we call Passion Week, and the The schedule is up here on the front row. I'd love you to pick one up and take home and use it this week as a family study guide. Carl and I were discussing this week, once again, when we should go to the Holy Land. And uh, I was thinking as I was studying the text this week, because I'd love to see some of the various places where Jesus went. And one of the things I'd like to do if I went to the Holy Land, at least I'd like to take a bus ride from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's not far. Jesus walked from Jericho to Jerusalem. And that's what he did that day. He walked from Jericho up to the city of Jerusalem to make his final entry into the city. And it's a barren road And there's many opportunities. In fact, it's the wilderness. It's the wilderness area where Jesus was tempted early in his ministry by Satan out there in the wilderness. And there's this road that goes through this wilderness that Jesus is traveling on on his last final trip to the city of Jerusalem. And here, there's this 
opportunity for Jesus just to slip off into the countryside and be gone. He didn't have to go to the city. He could have slipped away and, be, and been gone and not had to face the crucifixion. But Jesus chose to press on. To pass through this part of his journey. To pass on to the holy city. And that familiar road that people know today comes out of the wilderness on the eastern side of the city. And if you look in the back of your Bibles, my Bible has a map, a beautiful several three-color map of the city of Jerusalem and the final week of Jesus. And it shows where he went every day. And it shows, that, shows Jesus going, coming from Jericho up into the city of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is up on Mount Zion. And you go up into the city. And Jesus is passing now up into the city. And on that day, it's filled with hundreds of people because it's, the pa it's Passion Week. The Passover week is coming. The next Sunday is going to be, or the next Saturday is going to be Passover. And so all the Jews that have committed to make their pilgrimage that year are traveling in all kinds of different directions, coming to the city of Jerusalem, and hundreds are on this very same road that Jesus is walking on, going up into the city of Jerusalem. And then, then the gospel accounts show us that this is where Jesus tells his disciples to go and get the colt or the donkey. And I'll ride into the city. According to the gospel accounts, that's the day, that Sunday, the Sunday before Passover, which is on Saturday. That's the day that the Jews would go to the city and they would purchase their offering, whatever they could afford. And some of them could afford a lamb. Many of them could. And they would purchase their lamb that's to be sacrificed on that upcoming Passover Saturday. Some of them couldn't, and they would have to buy a dove or something less expensive to offer, maybe even a grain offering, to offer up on that Passover Saturday. So it's a, it's a busy day. But it's also a great time of celebration because the people are coming to celebrate the Passover. This was something significant. You know this in Israel's history because they looked back on that important day in their lives, in their forefathers' lives, when Moses told them to get a lamb on that night in Egypt and kill the lamb, put the, put the lamb over the doorposts, and the death angel, the last plague in Egypt, the death angel would come and pass over the land of Egypt and pass over any home that had the lamb's blood. They were to eat the lamb that night. It was a, they, they had the Passover meal in their homes, and they were safe. It's a wonderful story to read. Go back into the book of Exodus and read that story. So the historical significance of this day is traced all the way back to the book of Exodus. And now here's, see, here's the picture. Here's Jesus coming into the city on this colt, this donkey, and it's as, if, it's as if God is saying to the whole world and everyone there, this is the lamb. Here's my lamb. And they didn't know it. See, after Jesus' death on the cross, there would be no more need for Passover. That as no more lambs would be sacrificed because Jesus' blood, the true Lamb of God, His blood would be shed once and for all for the sins of the world. And that was it. So our Jewish friends today, and I'll see one of my Jewish friends tomorrow, my dentist is a, is a practicing Jew, and I'll see him tomorrow, and they will be celebrating Passover, but they won't kill a lamb. There's no temple to go to to offer a sacrifice. But they will remember. They will look back. There's something else about this season. As they look back over 
to the Passover in the, the history, they also were reminded that there is a Messiah coming. They believe that the Messiah is coming. The one that's going to set them free. And there's a historian named Josephus who writes much about this period. And he had recorded many instances of riots in the city of Jerusalem during Passover week. And the impression that Luke gives is that, that as the people were ascending up into the city, it's, it, it's somewhat calm until they see this Jesus, the one that many of them saw do these great miracles who claimed to be the Messiah, they saw him and then they began to shout, as Wade alluded to this morning, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were shouting this Hosanna because they believed he was the one that was going to set them free. Now this is where I want you to turn back to Matthew chapter 21 because I want you to look at a short account here that Matthew gives. Matthew 21. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them, bring them both to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Now notice verses 8. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches, these would be palm branches from the trees, and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed, they were all around Jesus, before and behind him. They cried out saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What they were saying that day was, Jesus, save us from our captors. Save us. We're sick of these Romans. And they failed to see the true reason that Jesus had come. And Matthew, he, he gives us a couple of details that really enriches our story. And one is the palm branches. I used to wonder what these palm branches meant as they spread them on the road and as they waved them in the air. And You know, you, you remember maybe in Sunday school growing up having palm branches on Palm Sunday. What did it mean? They were waving those palm branches. It's like us waving the American flag on July the 4th. To them, the palm branches meant freedom. Freedom from oppression. It's their way of saying, we want our freedom. We want deliverance. And then this word Hosanna, which really means save us. Save us now. But for the Jews of that day, it was more a political statement than a religious one. Save us from the Romans. We're sick of our captivity. Now, Jesus had come from the right direction, from the way the prophet said he would come. And it was in this context that the Pharisees said, you need to hush the people. Our account in Matthew, the account in Luke, because the people are beginning to celebrate too much. You need to hush these people because if things get out of control, the Roman centurion, the guards are going to be called out and we have great risk of the events being shut down and we're in big trouble. And this is when Jesus replied to them, hey, if they're silenced, you know what's going to happen? The stones will cry out. The rocks will cry out. You can't silence what I'm going to do. 
And then what happens next is key, I think, to understanding this eventful day. In verse 41, it records that, back in Luke, it records that our Lord pauses. Right in the middle of all of this celebration, he pauses and he weeps. He weeps over the city. And the gospel records say that on two occasions Jesus wept. One was at the tomb of Lazarus, his beloved friend, and the second one was here. He looks over the city and tears run down his face. And the lesson for us is, one of the lessons is, as Jesus looks over the city, he sees what the people cannot see. He sees their hearts. He sees their chains. And their chains are not chains of Roman domination. What Jesus had come to do was set people free from the chains, the bondage of sin. And he saw their hearts that they did not understand why he had come. And that's why he weeps. Scripture says he wept aloud. And that's the significant part of the story this morning. Why did Jesus weep? Because he saw in the hearts of the people. And he saw unbelief. He saw lack of repentance. And he saw, he knew of the coming judgment to Israel. There's something that Jesus knew that's important to us this morning. It's a powerful lesson. We don't need to forget it either. Jesus knew that revealed truth and the Jews had the truth. We have the truth. Revealed truth that does not result in repentance becomes the source of of greater condemnation. Revealed truth, we have it, that does not result in repentance, will result in greater condemnation. I close this morning. I put on the screen this morning, it's coming up, there are three categories of people that were present that day Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem. Three categories of people. Three here probably this morning. Number one, there were people who understood. They had a knowledge. They understood the message of Christ. They understood that Christ had come in the name of the Lord. The multitude knew who Jesus was. He was a great teacher. They called him rabbi. But they didn't understand or truly believe what they knew. See, they were wrong in their belief about the sort of deliverer he was. They knew he was a king. He was destined for great things. But they didn't understand the nature of his kingship. The nature of his kingdom. They were ready for an external physical kingdom. They were longing for that. Jesus had come to ignite, to begin, to set in place a spiritual kingdom that would be far more powerful, have far more consequences, far greater consequences than any earthly kingdom would ever have. Jesus had come to offer an infinitively greater blessing they wanted peace from the Romans, but Jesus was coming to give them a greater peace. A peace with the Holy God. Through the forgiveness of sins. By the way, the quest, there's no question of Roman. The Romans were a godless people and cruel oppressors. Jesus knew that. And their day was coming. The fall of Rome wasn't too far into the future. 
But Jesus knew that Rome wasn't Israel's greatest enemy. The greatest enemy of Israel, the greatest enemy that we face today is sin. So there were those who understood that message. And then there were those who believed. They moved to a point of belief, as in John chapter 6. They moved from a point of intellectual understanding to this point of, I do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. There's a story in John 6, Jesus is in Capernaum. It's a chapter worth reading this week. This is the sad irony of mere belief. Their words were right, but their hearts were not. And many people in the church fall into this category. They believe Jesus is truly the Messiah, but they stop there. And that's so dangerous. John Bunyan, who had such insight into this matter of salvation and the road of sanctification, once said, There is an entrance to hell even at the gates of heaven. People who are so close and yet so far. Then there's a third group of people. There were those around Jesus who had placed their trust in Christ as Savior. Mary, Martha, certainly Lazarus, Zacchaeus. Remember the woman at the well? Remember the woman with the blood issue, the blood disease? They moved from mere belief to trust in Jesus. He is the Messiah, and He has come to set us free from our sins. Here's the challenge, guys, to all of us who are Christians. This week, this Holy Week, is of tremendous importance to us in the church. It's our time of the year. It's one of our great times, and we've forgotten the church calendar. We've put it aside and forgotten so often what the implications of this week are to us. All the events of this week ultimately are going to point to the resurrection that's coming. We'll celebrate that next Sunday. In fact, I think you can look in the Old Testament and every chapter in the Old Testament is really pointing toward the coming of the Messiah and ultimately the resurrection. Here's the point. Everything, even the validity of Christ's message, everything or hangs on the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then we're living in nothing more than a fantasy life, a fantasy world. And there are two common time references that we maintain even as Christians today. The Jews were guilty of it, and so are we. There are two time references. They're not bad in, in and of themselves. But one is we look to the past, we do, as we remember when Jesus went to the cross. We look to the first coming of Jesus when he died and he rose again. We look in the past. And now we're looking to the future, the future resurrection. I was thinking this week about all the funerals I've done over the years and and I, I, so many of them were at Memorial Park on Poplar Avenue. And uh, some of the names came to mind. Gene Byers and Carla knows some of these people. Betty Ann Woodmansey and Dr. Statham and Gary Good, who died at a young age. And my good friend, Mike Myatt. And just Susan Leslie's mom last year. And, and I, every time I go out to the cemeteries, and I'm, I'm there in the cemeteries... I often remind those who are there standing around this casket and the grave that maybe this is the place we ought to be, hope to be on Resurrection Sunday. What an exciting place. What a place to be in Memorial Park on the Sunday of Resurrection or the day of Resurrection when those graves open up and we believe both the just and the just will come 
out of the unjust and the just will come out of the grave, be resurrected. What a wonderful experience to see all of that, and then we would be resurrected, the Bible says. But my point in saying all that is, we usually look to the past, because that's what this week will do for us, and then we point to the future, that day of the resurrection of our own bodies, and we forget about the present risenness of Christ, that He is alive today, and that He, the power of His resurrected life today is the same power that saves us from our sin and sustains us today. So when we celebrate the resurrection, let's don't just look to the past and look to the future, but let's celebrate it as a present reality. Celebrate it all week. Celebrate it next week and the week after. In fact, when we come every Sunday, that's what we're doing, is celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must take seriously the words of the risen Christ. Know that I am with you always, even to the end of time. He's with us right now. The power of the gospel is in the resurrection. And it's not just true and relevant, but the Bible says that it's dynamis or dynamic. It's like dynamite. It proclaims the living presence of the living God. And I'll tell you what we've been learning. We've been learning this in Romans, and we'll learn it this week. We'll learn it, we'll be reminded of it on Thursday night. The key to the kingdom of God is humility. Unless one comes broken before Jesus, humbles himself before the cross of Christ, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Humility. Brokenness over our sins. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer this morning as we close. It's a good time to remember some of the, some of the events of this great day what Jesus came to do the first time. He didn't come to sit on an earthly, king, on an earthly throne as the Jews had hoped. They had forgotten that Jesus would come first in order to die. We know that. We have the gospel accounts and we will remember that crucifixion this Thursday night. He came to die that we might live again and know him and he rose again that we might have the power to live the Christian life and live it in celebration, celebratory lives, lives of thanksgiving, Lives of laughter and joy and the peace of God and the peace and peace with God as we've learned in the book of Romans. He makes all the difference in the world. Father, we bless you this morning for the time that we've had together in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew to review the accounts of Jesus' final days. Some of those points we can look at more closely this week with our families. We thank you for that Jesus, as he walked that road from Jericho to Jerusalem for the final time, he chose to press on and to do the Father's will and to come to the city of Jerusalem knowing that he would go to 
to a Roman cross and die for the sins of the world, die for my sins and for the sins of people in this room, the sins of my grandsons, the sins of our children, and our nieces and nephews and our neighbors. And I pray that as we review and study through this week of, of Passion Week, that it will cause us to have a genuine desire to share with lost loved ones why Jesus came and why he died and why he rose again and why we believe that there will be another resurrection. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, stand with me this morning. Thank you for your prayers for me and for my family. And um, in the morning, Mary Moore is going in at 5 o'clock in the morning. It is tomorrow. Didn't you tell me? 5 o'clock in the morning to finally get this gallbladder out. So they got her all her... Everything else kind of stabilized at this point so she can go get that gallbladder out. She was with us last Sunday, and hopefully she'll be up and going, be with us on Easter Sunday. But pray for Mary more in the morning. As uh, you get up, think about her and pray that that surgery will go well, all right? I pray that the Lord will bless you this morning. He will keep you. The Lord will make his face shine upon you, and he will be gracious to you and that he will lift up his countenance toward all of you and give you peace. Amen.